whether or not there can be a systematic uh, Jewish theology um, depends on a few questions. I mean, really, whenever you ask a, a question like that, you have to define all your terms. So what does systematic theology mean and what does it mean for something to be Jewish? What does it mean for a theology to be Jewish? But at least uh, there's a concern uh, bubbling under the question. Um, the concern is that Judaism is defined much more in terms of practice than in terms of uh, than in terms of any set of belief. For instance, in in uh, a Christian denomination, you'll have a catechism where you can look up well, what is it that we believe? And some of them are very um, uh, full pictures, right? Um, uh, and if there is a Jewish catechism at all, it's very sketchy. So um, Maimonides. Uh, famously codified what he took to be uh, the principles of Jewish faith. He codified 13 of them. And the, uh, the basic idea was, so he said, if you don't believe one of these, not only can you not really call yourself a Jew, um, you won't have a share, a, a Jew who doesn't believe in one of these 13 won't have a share in the world to come. Um, however, uh, as is common in Jewish discussions, uh, his position wasn't universally agreed upon. Um, each one of the 13, or at least uh, a, a good deal of them, have been subject to controversy right from uh, the outset. So even some of the most, what you'd think kind of uh, beliefs that would be accepted by anybody, like the non-corporeality of, of God, that God uh, isn't comprised of matter, even that was a... Uh, a matter of controversy. Famously, uh, a, a French scholar, who the Rived, who read Maimonides' work, uh, said, you're right, I'm paraphrasing, of course, well, he said this in Hebrew anyway, he said, uh, you're right that God isn't corporeal, that he, doesn't, he isn't composed of, of matter and doesn't have material parts, doesn't have parts, uh, but people greater and wiser than you have thought otherwise. So who are you to say that, that, that you don't have a share in the world? To come if you don't believe this, you're not a Jew if you don't believe in this. Um, and these sorts of reflections, the sort of scholarship that Mark Shapiro has done, and, and, and another book by a, a scholar called Menachem Kelmer called Must a Jew Believe Anything, in which uh, he argues the answer to the question, must a Jew believe anything, according to Menachem Kelner, is yes, just not all that much, right? And um, the, the kind of uh, conclusion that these scholars are driving towards is that it's going to be very difficult to isolate a single set of beliefs that are necessary and sufficient for somebody to say, we're a believing Jew. Now, um, in some religions, what you'll have is... Uh, uh, a breaking, a kind of a branching of denominations around around a catechism. Well, we can't accept this doctrine, so you know, uh, we'll create our own church with this theological difference. In Judaism, there are uh, denominations. But that's a very, very modern phenomenon, uh, much, much later than the the Christian Reformation. Um, and broadly speaking, the Orthodox, Conservative, and Reform split is predominantly focused around um, authorship of the Bible issues and authority of Jewish law issues. Um, but what this masks is uh, a huge amount of theological diversity within each camp. So the Orthodox camp, which I belong to, um, includes Hasidic sects who kind of adopt a a radically imminent God, a God who's really kind of in your face, um, and panentheism, this notion that um, the universe is in some sense or other contained in God, something like a part of God. And then you have um, non-Hasidic, what you might think of mainstream theology uh, in Judaism that that has a much more scholastic taste. So it's almost kind of Catholic, right? So you have divine simplicity. It, it sounds like what you'd read in Aquinas, which is no surprise, because Aquinas was reading his Maimonides, and Maimonides was reading his Ibn Rushd. And I mean, it's that whole kind of um, movement. So what's happened kind of sociologically today is um, 
something that you might almost want to call orthopraxy. That what, as a sociological test, what makes you belong within orthodoxy has much more to do with how you behave than what you believe. Uh, now, this may have always been the case. Uh, Menachem Kellner argues in this Must a Jew Believe Anything book that um, when the Mishnah, which is a very old text, uh, uh, redacted in, in the third century, but including much earlier source material, the Mishnah uh, in Sanhedrin, in Tractate Sanhedrin, has what looks like a catechism, a very, very small one, which says, anybody who says that the Torah is not from heaven has no share in the world to come. Menachem Kellner points to that, that if you look carefully at the formulation of that catechism, it's anybody who says, not necessarily anybody who believes. Um, and in fact, in the context of the tractate and of the Mishnah as a whole, what it really looks like is it's an anti-sectarian uh, principle. We need kind of conformity of behavior to have this organized group. And if you're going to go around saying things, which can't fit in, then that's really problematic. But what you believe, says Menachem Kellner, is kind of left uh, unaddressed by uh, this text. And fast forwarding into the contemporary age, um, I think a lot of my co-religionists uh, are not all that interested when push comes to shove in what the person in the pew next to them believes, so much as do they abide by dietary requirements, do they, you know, this, this kind of obsession with practice has, ha, is probably related to the phenomenon of philosophy within Orthodox Judaism being something of a taboo. Because if you go and study philosophy, Jewish philosophy, well, maybe you'll start asking questions that you can't answer and you'll stop behaving in conformity with this principle. Maybe it's better for you not to think about this stuff. So part of the question you're asking me when you say, can there be systematic Jewish theology could be a sociological question. Well, w will contemporary Judaism allow for such a thing? Now, I think some streams of Judaism, whether it's reform or conservative Judaism, might be more uh, 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 amenable. Uh, the right of the spectrum, to which I, I generally belong, Orthodox Judaism, um, I think w will find the whole endeavor somewhat more problematic, lest we be led to, to thoughts that we can't really deal with. Um, on the other hand, um, when we think theoretically rather than sociologically, there's something very exciting going on. Because um, if you belong to a religious tradition that has an authoritative catechism, then your philosophical speculating is somewhat hamstringed into uh, providing an analysis of the content of the catechism and then providing a justification for believing in it. Whereas in Judaism, we don't have that so much. Uh, even the 13 principles of Maimonides was reduced by later thinkers just to three principles. So, so uh, you find that in Franz Rosenzweig, but you find it much earlier in, in Rabbi Albo, um, in his Sefer Ikrim, the, his book of fundamental principles. You have these three notions that God created the world, God is involved in the process of revelation and that God is going to be involved or is involved or will be involved in the, in the process of salvation, redemption, the, the messianic peace that's within uh, Judaism. So within those very broad parameters, we can fill this out kind of however much we like. And it turns out that um, the goal of, of, of Jewish theology, uh, especially uh, from an orthodox perspective, and this is probably true for some people within the conservative uh, movement, uh, what, what they all have in common, uh, um, the orthodox grouping and many in the conservative grouping, is uh, the prime importance they place upon halachic observance, living according to the laws of Judaism as codified by the rabbis. Although there are going to be disagreements between orthodoxy and conservatism as to what those laws actually are. Um, with, within those communities, what the prime goal of Jewish theology is going to be is justifying this practice. Why do you observe these laws? Now, you and I might both be Jews, and we might both keep the exact same laws, but for widely different reasons, right? Your God 
might be the imminent panentheistic God of, of uh, the Hasidim. My God might be the uh, simple, unmoved mover of, of Maimonides. Uh, but as long as the theologies that we have developed um, are both consistent with the practice of Jewish law and, uh, ideally, help to motivate the practice of Jewish law, such that if you accept the principles that we come up with, you'll be rationally justified in, in, in practicing Jewish law, then really things are wide open. Um, so, so can there be a systematic th Jewish theology? I don't think there can ever be one. Uh, that's to say, uh, like I said, in a religion which defines itself very tightly around acceptance to a catechism, you might say, well, there can only be one systematic uh, theology for this religion. Um, what it, what it needs to do is to provide the best analysis of, this, uh, of the words, of the, the content of this catechism, and then justify it, give a justification. Um, so, so maybe there'll be competing analyses, completing justifications, but you're going to have a very tight group of, uh, of closely related theologies. Um, Judaism, in principle, gives you room for, for, for many more theologies, not one systematic Jewish theology. And, and at least coming, speaking f f from within orthodoxy, and like I said, potentially for many people in the conservative camp, um, what's going to matter at the end of the day is, whatever you've come up with, does it make sense of this practice?